Uh, okay, so just a little bit about myself. I think we're supposed to take a little bit of time for introductions. I have spent 30 years in higher education uh, in the United States and in Africa. Virtually all of that in Africa was in the West African country of Liberia. Uh, I have taught ecology and anthropology and public health. So I kind of integrate those three areas in, in the type of research I do, but also in the, in the teaching that I do. Uh, I was the vice president for research at two Liberian uh, universities, one of which is, is your sister university, United Methodist University in, in Liberia. Uh, so I'm very aware of, I've never been to your, your beautiful campus, but I'm very aware of African University and, and the tremendous things that, that you are doing there, and especially in, in the environmental area. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm still involved in, in Liberia projects, primarily through being a research associate, associate with the University of Liberia, and then also an NGO that we founded, oh gosh, 10 or 20 years ago, that works with forest people uh, with regard to livelihoods and development and natural resource management, uh, trying to mediate some of these changes for, from climate change and, and, and some of the agricultural development and, and other initiatives that, that really impact local people. I really appreciate the two presentations we've just had. I think, I think both of you are, are my sisters and brothers, maybe different parents, but sisters and brothers, because you talk about serving those people that we work with. And that is exactly what we have to do in environmental work. And we have to be humble uh, and we have to really work closely with people. It's the only way we're going to solve some of the problems that we really have. Uh, so, what I did, other than, than being a, a professor and, and, and being a, a, a vice president for research, uh, in my research areas, I basically was a disease ecologist. So we look at, at anim, animal diseases and human diseases and how they, how they cross into one population or the other. And we try to understand how these diseases impact the health of of uh, the animals and the health of the humans once they get into a human population. Obviously, we try to keep them from getting into the human population. But as we all know from that wonderful presentation of, of Dr. Lawrence's, uh, COVID is, is very much on our minds right now. And it is an animal disease that came from, from Asian bats. It's a coronavirus. Most animal species have coronaviruses, including humans. We have four or five of our own versions and this, this, this new one will just become a new human coronavirus. Uh, but these come out of animals generally and move into human populations. Uh, so it's one of the things that we've studied in Liberia for the past 30 years is understanding the interactions between people and animals and trying to understand how we can, can modulate or control the movement of these pathogens into human populations. And if they get there, what can we do about trying to, to prevent and control the, the further transmission of these? So in Liberia over the past 30 years, I've, I've worked with traditional hunters, farmers, and healers, uh, trying to understand local natural resource use, how animals and humans interact, uh, and trying to build support for a variety of international organizations for, for working with local people and listening and talking to local people. Uh, and, and that's been somewhat frustrating uh, because a lot of top-down programs uh, have not been really very effective. And it's one of the reasons I believe Dr. Lawrence talked about doing participatory work. We need to be sitting in, down and talking together and working together rather than, than having programs coming from the outside. At any rate, I've also done some, some natural resource programming and capacity building at the various universities. Uh, and then working at the community level in several dozen communities working on, on training and interventions in community health. Uh, and I'm currently on the board of the Friends of Liberia. The Friends of Liberia is a large international organization that brings together all of us who have a love for that country. Uh, and we continue to try to serve and raise money and work on initiatives, especially during COVID times, but, but also during the Ebola outbreak a few years ago. Uh, well, for those of us that have been in this conservation work for two or three decades now, the, one of the grandfathers, the great founders of, of African conservation was Bada Dayoum, a Senegalese conservationist. And he, he made this wonderful quote that most of us took to heart uh, many, many years ago. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. 
I think coming out of education, that speaks to most of us that, that we really have to talk about issues before we can ever come to appreciate eventually to love those, those aspects of the natural environment that maybe some of us uh, are not as aware of as, as others. So uh, a great a great states person, international player that, that really brought much to this conversation of, with regard to African uh, comfort, uh, conservation. Well, these are some of the threats, of course. So every, every country has a, a unique uh, threat profile from, from climate change. But these are some of the things that, that various organizations project for Liberia. And you're aware of, of all of these things. Agricultural production will be impacted, water resources, coastal zones, especially coastal erosion, which is happening tremendously in Liberia right now. The fisheries are heavily impacted. And, and through the, the studies we've done of animal protein sources in people's diets, fisheries, uh, both coastal and inland, are much more important than, than other types of animal protein. So we really face a crisis with, with fisheries and, uh, and diversity loss of, of different species, but also crashing, crashing populations of a lot of these uh, fish species. And then the last one is human health, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today because it's the area that I've really worked in, integrating ecology and health uh, and local people. So this is a photo when I was working in Liberia probably 20 years ago, and it shows you the extent of that tropical rainforest. Uh, it's, it's just massive. It, it, Liberia remains the largest having the largest percentage of, of land in, in forest of, of the West African countries, about 40% of the total expanse of, of, the, of this type of rainforest is, is in Liberia. So here we were moving back and forth between different rural villages and about the only way to travel is, is by helicopter. Uh, that's less so today and I will show you why and it's very discouraging with the deforestation that's gone on. But you see these massive uh, West African rainforests. They're very valuable. Uh, they have the highest mammal and snake diversity globally. Now, some of us may not be really fond of snakes, but some of us are very fond of, of mammals. And it has the highest diversity uh, of the global hotspots uh, anywhere in the world. So basically, if we, if we look at some of the projections for Liberia, which are already starting to come true from climate change, as you get decline in harvesting, uh, Timber products are, are heavily impacted. They're obviously being extracted, but also when you change the land use patterns, you basically take land rights away from local people who have held them traditionally for, for many hundreds of years, uh, perhaps even a couple of thousand in Liberia. Uh, you're increasing the duration, the intensity of these rainfall events. You're changing patterns with regard to, to drought. There's incredible erosion. We all realize with regard to environmental studies and geologic studies of Africa that the, the rainforest belt is really very poor soils. These massive 100 feet, 150 tall foot tall trees really are, are living on very, very marginal soils because most of, most of the, the nutrients have been leached out. And, and in a tropical rainforest, your nutrients are really tied up in, in the canopy. So, as you, as you deforest these areas, the erosion just becomes enormous and you lose whatever soil is there, which heavily impacts local people doing subsistence farming in these areas. So you have the increased incidence then of human disease and other sorts of, of biological pests, and of course the decline of, of forest cover. As I said, we're seeing all of these in Liberia over the past 20 years. Well, I love that slide that, that Professor Farusa had about the animals of, uh, of basically the southern and, and eastern part of the continent. The interesting thing about these Liberian forests is that they've got kind of a different set of, ma uh, of mammals. You might see a, a forest elephant there in the, the upper right-hand side, and then, then over towards the, the left, you've got a chimpanzee, and those are things that occur pretty much across a lot of Africa. Uh, but most of these other species, well, all of these other species you see here are very unique to the West African forest. They do not occur anywhere else uh, in the world. They don't occur anywhere else in, in Africa. So it's a very unique group of animals that the people have had relationships with for, for several hundreds, again, possibly thousands of years. Many great stories, many ways to use the, uh, the different uh, aspects of, of these animals for, for, for medicine and a variety of other things. So a very important fauna that is truly, truly being threatened with extinction uh, at the current time. 
Well, this is that West African area, and you see the Upper Guinea hotspot. Uh, this, that's the area that's kind of outlined in black. So you can see how fragmented already the forests are across West Africa. Uh, and you see the area outlined in purple there, which is Liberia, and within it, Sapo National Park, which we created in 1986, uh, and, is, and is about 500 square miles of, of lowland tropical rainforest. Uh, but basically, we've been doing long-term studies there, but it's heavily impacted by poaching, heavily impacted by mining, timber extraction, despite it, the fact that many of these areas in Liberia are protected under law, there's just really difficult to, to, to get good enforcement in these areas. Uh, they're very hard to get to, very rural, and, and uh, very difficult to, to do strong forest enforcement in these areas. Well, you've also got the situation where you've got the high forest. You also have people who are very dependent on it, very low population density, but people who are who have lived in these areas for, for entire family histories of generations uh, using this land for subsistence farming and for, for getting medical products and, and non-timber products out of the forest for use uh, for their livelihoods. And these are all impacted uh, tremendously during, during the present time. So if you look at that lower right-hand photo, you have a, a satellite image of, of really the, the forests left in Liberia, two major forests in the south and then up in the north. But then if you look at the slide on the left and the darker colors with regard to orange and red are where people have the most food insecurity. So this is something we find in environmental justice studies is this that, and, and we've already talked about it with regard to the presentation by Professor Farusa and, and Dr. Lawrence too, really, that those most impacted are and most threatened by climate change and, and some of these, uh, these other impacts of, of development and change are really those that are the most food insecure. So we've, we've got a major obligation. We've really got to be talking to people and being aware of those people who are most impacted by the changes we see going on globally and locally. Uh, a lot of the work that we did over their 20 or 30 years was trying to understand people, uh, it, their interactions with animals and taking animals off the land for food, but also for income. Uh, the, the wildlife harvest is a huge income source for rural people, and it allows them to survive and send their kids to school and, and get the things they need to, to make it in a very marginal environment where, where it's difficult enough to scrape a living with regard to your nutrition, uh, but you've also got to be able to have uh, other money available for the, the disposable uh, items and dispensable items that you need to, to really survive. So it's a, it's a great sort of occupation uh, for some people because it's easy to get into. Uh, both sexes generally can be involved in this and there's, there's good value in it as, as, a, as an economic or, or commodity chain. So you have hunters and smokers, you've got local market salesperson, you have transporters that collect this meat and, and take it to the cities. And there you have urban markets, street vendors, chop shops uh, that are part of this economic chain. It has a tremendous impact uh, on, on rural countries. And, and we tried to document this in, in Liberia. Uh, this is kind of a complex slide a little bit, but it looks at the economic impact this was, these data are about 10 years old. We've not done a follow-up study uh, due to the Ebola outbreak and COVID, and we really need to get in and, and do some more estimates. Uh, but if you just look at the, the communities around that Sapo National Park, uh, it's a tremendous amount of annual income. Uh, the, the per capita income in Liberia now, as we think around $200 a year, maybe, maybe $300 a year. Uh, but in some of these rural areas, when you have the supplementation of this income from, from wildlife hunting and, and selling of bushmeat, it really impacts local lives, it impacts the local economy. Uh, so if you have a hunter household, you may have as much as 303 annual dollars more than you would have otherwise. That's a lot of money. That's the per capita income of the entire country. Uh, so, so this is, this is, can be lucrative, it can be a survival technique for, for those people living uh, in, in the situation. But to double that of the non-hunting households and the national value we projected was $78 million, which is actually more than the timber industry. Uh, so you think about the timber industry pulling all of the trees out and selling them internationally, they don't go to benefit the local uh, 
economy. They really don't do anything to, to provide this, the, the sawmills and the wood that allow you to use those, as, those materials as construction ma materials locally. They're gone. Uh, they're out of the country. So actually hunting is, is a more important aspect of forest management probably than, than timber, which is not the usual way the international sector looks at it. Now this again is too complex a slide, but just say that in the disease ecology, we want to understand patterns of transmission and we want to be able to predict. So this force of infection is just a formula we use to predict how often an animal disease is gonna cross over and get into the human population. So there are a bunch of assumptions that you have to make and you have to know your study area very carefully and the types of, of diseases that are already there. And there's dozens of these viruses uh, that are out there in, in the natural environment anywhere you have animals and, and humans interacting. But basically what we came down to was with very conservative, very conservative assumptions. One person every other year contracts a directly transmitted non-human primate zone, zone, uh, well, disease. So we only looked at primates here because primates are really dirty. They have a lot of, a lot of different viruses and diseases and there's a lot of interaction between humans and non-human primates. So we looked primarily at them uh, with regard to the offtake of, of, of the hunting. Uh, so a more realistic assessment is that you have several transmission events per year in, in a tropical area. And certainly the, the coronavirus that came out of the Asian bat species, we knew, we knew that those, those bat species had that coronavirus. We know that African species of bats have their own coronaviruses. So this was really just a matter of time. And these things don't stay local, local they go global, right? So this is one of the reasons that you want to study this, but you also during, during the time that you're studying it need to be aware of the needs of local people and the impact it has on their livelihood. Uh, so remember that slide in your head of the helicopter flying over that tropical forest. If you flew over those areas today, this is, this is what you would see. The forest is really gone. These are, these are palm plantations. Uh, there's a lot of massive international agriculture coming into a place like Liberia. Uh, and what it does is it takes land away from local people. Obviously it takes those animals away, which we've said scare us because they have diseases that get into humans, but also they provide economic benefits and income for survival for local people. Uh, and this is going on all over Liberia. As I flew back and forth on the helicopter, my last assignment there was at a university called Tubman University in the southeast. And it's so far away, the only way we could get back and forth from the capital was to fly on these UN helicopters. Uh, and, 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 and it, was, it was really difficult getting back and forth. But you're flying over what used to be pure tropical rainforest and you see all these plantations being op opened up for palm and, and oil palm and, and it's happening globally. I also work in, the so in Southeast Asia and in Cambodia and, and Vietnam and you see the same thing. It's soybeans, it's not necessarily palm trees, but you certainly got the palm plantations affecting Indonesia and other areas. And all of these have tremendous negative impacts on the local people. So if you look at some of these climate land use changes and, and, and people, you have threats to livelihood from subsistence agriculture to hunting. You have increased infectious diseases moving across those species boundaries. We've got animal diseases moving into humans and actually human diseases moving into to animals. This COVID disease moves back and forth. We're starting to see in the United States that domestic animals are picking up this COVID and so they're going to maintain it out there. It will change a little bit. It'll be more adapted to those animals. But we're seeing that anytime you have humans and animals in interaction, which is all of human history, then you're going to have the movement of these pathogens between the animals and the humans back and forth. The other thing you see is, is deforestation having a tremendous impact on, on the local microclimate eventually, of course, on global climate. Land tenure and use of fruct rights, who gets to use the land, who planted the, the fruit tree and who has access to it. These are all cultural uh, and, and different people in different areas have different norms and values and, and to, taboos and rules on this. But the point is you need to understand them because you're going to impact it. Anytime you do development and anytime we have climate change, we can't talk about mediating climate change without understanding the local culture. And that comes from listening and talking and sitting down in humility and, and respect. So a lot of microclimatic changes and, and that's going to, to mean that there are different invasive species with regard to primarily insects, but, but other, other animals as well. 
uh, that move into an area that have never traditionally been there. Sometimes they bring disease, sometimes they just eat all your crops. Uh, so we're going to see massive changes with regard to the microclimatic level. And then of course, viral spillover, which is what this COVID disease is all about, and Ebola, uh, and, and most of the other diseases that, that we really have dealt with in, in the past 20 or 30 years. HIV is an animal disease that moved over into humans. So HIV, AIDS, Ebola, uh, dengue, uh, uh, COVID, all of these diseases are things that we need to be concerned about as we have a changing relationship with the land and with the environment. So what do you do and what do we all do? This seems like a massive issue and a, and a massive problem and it is, but we can't do anything if we don't talk about it. We've got to talk about it in our local communities. We've got to talk to one another. We need to be talking internationally and globally, of course, but I'm, I'm more focused on local people. I'm more interested in, in how this impacts them. So the main thing is that we just can't avoid these issues. Here in the United States, we still don't like to talk about these issues. They're very political, they're very controversial. In the area that I live right now in the Southern United States, we can't even talk about climate change. It's considered a hoax and, and it's because people don't have any knowledge or relationship with those on the front lines who are actually living climate change right now. It's been going on for, for decades. And yet if you, if you can't see that, if you don't know it, uh, it's very hard to understand. So we need to talk to one another in our local communities, wherever they are in the world. Uh, when you start having those conversations, you need to be respectful and, and different, uh, and you need to be a, a servant. And I, I love that Dr. Lawrence said that again, we are there to serve one another. And, and I think that's what brings us together as communities of faith as well. So you always start with this question, tell me about your people and how you came to be here. There is nobody that won't answer that question. There is nobody that doesn't want to tell you about their lives and their histories and their families and, 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 and how they survive. It's a matter of just being willing to listen. And that's the opening dialogue to learning the things that we need to know to be able to connect with one another and understand and respect different perspectives and different needs uh, that, that people have. We talk about showing intentionality, which I, I define for my students as listening with the heart. You need to sit down and listen, truly listen with your heart to what is being said and connect with that person and build that trust that's going to be necessary as we make really difficult decisions going into the future. Uh, we need to ask about local changes. They're, they're, they're impacting people right now. Here where I live in the southern United States, we're losing our fisheries. We're losing our uh, our shellfish industries because the climate has changed enough that it's killing out those, those mussel populations of, of shellfish, which are a, a pretty big source of nutrition around here. But it's going on anywhere in the world. If you ask people, they'll say, well, yeah, uh, it, is, it does seem a little bit different. A very quick story. I first started working in Liberia in 1988. I land on the ground. I'm out there in the rural southeast. I mean, there is only, only farmers and myself, the only white guy in, in, in 10 million miles, and they're saying, tell me what's going on. Something's changing. All the rules that we had about when you plant and when the rains will come and when the soil is the right temperature, something's changing. And I really didn't know how to answer that question, but my friends, that was 30 years ago. I remember my grandfather could pick up the soil and, and feel by the texture of it and the temperature of whether it was the right time to plant or not. The Liberian farmers were recognizing that 30 years ago. We've all known this. Uh, so we need to think about, uh, about local land use and, and what people know and learn what they know about the land. And they'll tell you, yeah, things are changing. Something's a little bit different than it's been in the past. We need to get information with regard to income and livelihood. This is what we call the informal sector. Those people selling that bush meat are not employed by some company. Uh, they don't get a salary. They don't get a wage. Uh, it's an informal sort of profession that's really not part of the formal economy and often not taken into account with regard to economic studies. But it's huge. And there's many other things that do, people do informally, of course, to make a living. Uh, and we need to understand what their needs are financially and emotionally. Talk to people about the changes they notice because they notice them when you really get down and, and talk on, on a level uh, that says, tell me about your life. Uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot of things. Yield space, give voice, appreciate diversity, nourish dignity. We've all got to take that attitude of, of humility into this work that, that these people are the experts about their life. They're the experts about their environment, not us, we're outsiders. And anybody who goes into a new area is an outsider. 
and, and you should be expect to be met with a little bit of skepticism because they're experts and they know what their life is. They depend on their knowledge to survive. Sometimes we need to make sure that these individuals are truly represented in the, in the, in the halls of power and in international meetings. We need to do everything that we can to get local people to these meetings. I've tried to get all of the people that I've worked with, the, the leaders uh, in, in rural uh, Liberia into these, into these meetings locally. And a few of them we've been able to take internationally to, to stand up and tell their story. People need to hear these stories from real people. So we need to do that. But sometimes when that doesn't happen, each of us has a moral obligation to be a voice if we've been asked to be one, to share what, what we've learned from, from these stories that we've heard, to be an advocate uh, in, in, the, in the, the houses of power where, where a great many people are, are truly marginalized and excluded from being part of the decision-making process. And then you need to mentor and empower local people by joining in solidarity. The project we have right now going in Liberia that we just started is, is monitoring pangolin populations, very rare and unique mammal, highly impacted uh, under severe threat for, for extinction. And we're training uh, new field investigators in Liberia. One of the, the students that I, that I had when I was at Tubman University, that my last assignment there in Liberia, was very impressive and very, very motivated. So he is now traveling the country and helping us do surveillance and understand local people's needs and, and how local people interact with these pangolins. Uh, so, so mentor and empower people. You have a responsibility. I used to tell my students, even in the United States, if you get a college degree, you're like, uh, you're like one out of 15 people in the country. You're going to be a leader. People are going to look up to you. They're going to respect what you know. And you've got to give back and you've got to lead and you've got to teach and, and empower and mentor people. That's what a college degree is. It's not just a way that you make a living. Uh, it's not just your passion for some area of knowledge. It's the fact that you, you get the opportunity to give back. So that's really what we can all do. It seems really simple, but if we all did that, think about it we really can solve some of these global issues that we have. Thank you guys for listening to me.